I'm Phil Rickaby, and I've been a writer and performer for almost 30 years. But I've realized that I don't really know as much as I should about the theater scene outside of my particular Toronto bubble. Now, I'm on a quest to learn as much as I can about the theater scene across Canada. So join me as I talk with mainstream theater creators you may have heard of, and indie artists you really should know, as we find out just what it takes to be stage-worthy. If you value the work that I do on Stageworthy, please consider leaving a donation either as a one-time thing or on a recurring monthly basis. Stageworthy is created entirely by me, and I give it to you free of charge with no advertising or other sponsored messages. Your continuing support helps me to cover the cost of producing and distributing the show. Just four people donating $5 a month would help me cover the cost of podcast hosting alone. Help me continue to bring you this podcast. You can find a link to donate in the show notes, which you can find in your podcast app or at the website at stageworthy.ca. Now, on to the show. S.E. Grummet, or Grums, is a queer transgender artist originally from the prairies. They recently returned from an award-winning season at the Edinburgh Fringe with their duo comedy show, Creepy Boys. Their solo show, Something in the Water, heads to the next stage festival just this week. In this episode, we talk about presenting a show at the Edinburgh Fringe, the genesis of Something in the Water, the importance of queer stories, and much more. Here's our conversation. You actually mentioned going to Edinburgh and coming back from Edinburgh. Were you there for the full month? Yeah, we were there for the full month. When I say we, I mean uh, my partner and I. This was our second Edinburgh. Um, We did it for the first time last year with Something in the Water. And his solo show, uh, Full Moon Coming, Big Big Wonderful, High Five, True Love, Spanks, Spanks, So Fun, Great Times. Uh, that's the full title. Well done. Well done, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. And then this year we were back with our duo show, Creepy Boys. Um, so I think a lot of people maybe who haven't been to to Edinburgh are curious about, about that experience. Um, what, if you, if somebody has only done, okay, first off, somebody's only done the Toronto Fringe, um, they probably don't know what other fringes are like. But if you if you've been to Edmonton, you see how big that is. How like what is Edinburgh like? Uh, so Edinburgh mm. is the first the OG fringe. Um, I think it just celebrated its seventy fifth this year. Um, and yeah, like you said, Edmonton is about two hundred two hundred and fifty shows, give or take. Uh, Winnipeg is the second biggest. It's around the same size, a little smaller. I think Toronto Fringe is about a hundred shows. Ish. Ish. Depending on I the year. Ish. Yeah. And and depending on pre year post COVID. Um, Edinburgh is in at its biggest was about four thousand and some shows. Jeez. And even uh since the pandemic, it's still around thirty five hundred shows. And that runs for a month, right? It's a it's yeah, it's a month long, the whole month of August. Um the population of Edinburgh triples. Uh, over the festival season and there's also edinburgh book festival and edinburgh international festival and so there's all these other festivals on it's the height of tourism uh season and so it is wild it is a wild time it is you will feel every emotion that you could possibly ever feel in edinburgh um the highs the lows the everything in between yeah it's it's amazing and horrible all at once I was I was doing a smaller uh, fringe tour of one of my shows a while back, and I had the thought, like, if at some point during your tour, you don't feel like you're an absolute failure, are you really on a fringe tour? Because, um, you know, the the highs, the lows, the like, oh, this show does, does really well. And then all of a sudden, everybody hates this. Sh-. Like, it just, the changes. And over a month in a, in a, at a festival like Edinburgh, it must be like a yo-yo. 
Absolutely. And it's it's so much more competitive than the Canadian French circuit. Like I've done three tours of the Canadian French circuit and it's it's wonderful and it's lovely. And you have this uh, support system of other touring artists there. Uh, the volunteers are amazing and they they'll come and show you their spreadsheet of all the shows they're going to go to. And and there are people like passionate and trying to go see everything at the festival. Um, they also bill at you. So your accommodation is covered. Whereas Edinburgh is like living inside of Instagram for a full month uh-huh. where you're just like comparing yourself to all the other shows and everybody winning awards and everybody getting great reviews. Uh, somebody I know put it this way of uh, imagine writing, writing an exam with everybody else in your entire industry. Uh, and at the end of the day, all of your results get posted and you do that for an entire month straight. So it is not, I, I really, I've done the Australian circuit, which is, uh, still about Adelaide's the second biggest fringe and it's about 1200 shows. And so I was a little bit prepped for Edinburgh. Like I wasn't going from, okay, I've done the Saskatoon fringe with our 30 shows. I throw them under the bus cause that's my hometown fringe and I've worked for them. Uh, and going to Edinburgh, like I was, I was a little bit prepped and I saw how much marketing resources you need and how much you need to try and sell your show and how competitive it can be. But even then, I really underestimated the like toll on mental health that on my mental health that Edinburgh can have and the the wildly different versions of a run that you can have. Like I did something in the water. The show did pretty well, but not amazing uh sam struggled he was in this weird venue we found out during his tech rehearsal that he was in a shipping container yeah and then this year with creepy boys we had an amazing run it felt like everybody was talking about the show Mm. it was it was kind of that like little buzz that you get on the canadian circuit and that was really special so it can be wildly different and it feels like entirely out of your control yeah and yeah so you you went last year and you had that first experience where the show did okay yeah and then you decided to go back a year later why so soon like what 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 made you want to go back uh we did creepy boys in australia and we had um, we we originally made the show um, for Melbourne Fringe in 2020 when my partner and I were stuck in Australia. Um, and we had then performed it a little bit live here and there. And we were starting to realize that it really didn't work. The show in, in that current iteration uh, really didn't work for live audiences. It, there was no room for the audience. Um, and so we were like, let's make just like a couple changes. Let's make a few rewrites. And we hired my uh, the director of my solo show, Something in the Water, uh, Deanna Flesher, who is famous for her interactive clown show, Buck Kapinski. She does a lot of work with um, comedians and and clowns. Um, and so we worked with her and we're like, hey, we're just going to make a few small changes. And then we basically flamethrowed the whole old show. We kept one joke and we got really excited about Uh, making this show that sort of looked at millennial nostalgia and we did it in australia this past january february march we did a tour and we were there and we were like oh maybe the show is not just like the cute little side project that we've had for a couple years maybe this is like our next work and the programmer for summer hall which is one of the the sort of like the the biggest theater venue in Edinburgh. So they program a lot of uh, sort of cutting edge theater and performance. And um, a lot of the stuff they program will go on to win awards and things like that. Lots of reviewers will go there. Um, That's where Something in the Water was last year. So we had a good relationship with the venue. But their programmer came to see us in Adelaide and he offered us a spot. And we had basically written off doing the festival. But I think both of us... uh, got this offer and we were like oh do we want to go back and we were really on the fence and then we decided yeah screw it let's just go let's just go maybe it'll be terrible 
we didn't have as much grant support as we had the year before. We had almost no grant support. We're like, let's do this. We were going to Europe um, with a new show that was going to the Prague Quadrilennial in June. So we're like, okay, if we can just stay alive in Europe for a month, ride it out, then we'll go to Edinburgh. The flights are covered from that other project. Let's just go. Um, And we did. And I'm really glad we did because it was it was amazing. Awesome. Awesome. I will say, uh, Bud Kapinski. I saw Bud Kapinski in the at the Montreal Fringe as part of the a Fringe tour. I was on at the time in 2012, and it's still one of my favorite shows. Yeah, absolutely. I saw it at Toronto Fringe 2017, and I saw it, and I went, "You can do that!" <laughs> and then I went away, this little like baby queer baby clown, and emailed Deanna, and I was like, "Would you want to make a show?" And that's how Something in the Water was born. Nice. So. Great yeah. segue, by the way. Uh, something in the Water, you're doing that at the Next Stage Festival. It's the first, second year in, not in the dead of winter. Um, so, what is, tell me about Something in the Water. Um, so, Something in the Water is my solo show. It's a querying of a monster transformation story where I turn into a giant squid monster Um with tentacle penises as a metaphor for my coming out and transition as transgender. Um, so Deanna and I set out, I at first was like, I want to make a Buffon show about gender. And for those of you that don't know Buffon, it's like, I'm going to explain it poorly and people will argue with me, but the, the, the most simple way I can put it is like clown, butt mean. Um, so Buffon is like trying to expose society's problems and it can be very in your face. And it's, um, it will always have a point of attack. And I was like, yeah, I want to make this show. And Deanna uh, said to me, like, hey, the queerdo weirdos that are going to come to a show like this don't really need to be yelled at, like, what's your gender? Because they're living that. Like, they're living uh, being marginalized and being not perceived the gender that they are. Um, and they're living the transphobia. You don't need to, like, tell them that transphobia exists they know um and so we instead made this weird little show um and then i did a work in progress version at the saskatoon fringe in 2019 before the pandemic and then the pandemic happened and i was stuck in australia and so i went back to work on it a little bit more um and i brought deanna back on to work with me again and i also worked with um, the queer shadow puppet duo Mind of a Snail. And they helped me like really rework the live feed video in the show. So it is all immersive and DIY with these little paper puppets that really make it feel uh, kind of ripped out of the pages of a comic book. Yeah. And then the show has, uh, it premiered at the Adelaide Fringe in 2021. And we've just been touring it around the world kind of ever since. Awesome. Um, so... The the you know not again not wanting to do Buffon with this sort with this with this topic, um. So I will ask I will ask the question, uh, why comedy? Yeah, I uh, I'm really drawn to comedy as a as a sort of Trojan horse for uh, political messages. <laughs> my queer propaganda, if you will, um, my queer agenda. But I think comedy is a really great way of making work accessible and coming from the prairies. um, Sometimes I'm the first trans person that, uh, to quote my friend, uh, stand-up comedian Anna Piper Scott, I'm maybe one of the first trans people you'll meet in the wild. So people are coming in with these notions of like what trans looks like or what trans stories are and i find that with comedy i can really disarm and disrupt that like we can all laugh at how ridiculous it is that my squid monster has to put on a dress and high heels and get into the women's bathroom and try and pass so i find that comedy can i've really been able to reach an audience in a very different way than if i i hadn't have done that if i had of if i would have made maybe a buffon show or a uh another show my first my first show uh scum a manifesto was um 
Can I swear on this podcast? Uh, fuck yes. Oh, oh, fucking great. Uh, what I lovingly call a fuck you play. It was very, uh, it was a very yelly play. It was a very, um, these are my thoughts and feelings and I have a lot of anger. And I was fresh out of school. My co-writer, Caitlin, and I were fresh out of school. It was like right when Me Too was happening. And we made a very like angry play. And I, I love that show. It was a great, I'm really proud of that show. But I also found that it, it, it didn't reach an audience in the same way. And I think it's always, um, I'm always conscious of like, what do I want this play to do? What do I want my work to do? And that's not to say that like, I'll never make a fuck you play again. I'm really excited about making that. Um, I'm really excited about a play that lets an audience feel their anger. But with something in the water, I wanted to make something that queer to weirdos in the audience um, felt really empowered by. And folks who've maybe met, never met a trans person can also understand like how the gender binary is ridiculous. Uh, comedy is is very powerful in the way that you mentioned. It can it can plant a seed through laughter in the way that hitting somebody over the head with a sledgehammer with an idea will not. Um, Sometimes sledgehammer is nice, but yes, you put this so much more eloquently than I did. <laughs> I just find, I mean, yes, there there's a time and a place for the sledgehammer, but when you use the sledgehammer, you get people the idea. There are people who resist the idea. With comedy you kind of trick them into accepting the idea because they laugh at it. And they're yeah. sort of more accepted. People are more accepting when they're laughing. So, you know, that's a very powerful tool. And I think that Deanna and I worked along a really fine line of, you're never laughing at me being trans. You're laughing at how ridiculous it is that society would ask this squid monster to not be a squid monster. And so I think that that was a really fine line of, uh, it's not self-deprecating. Right. And so I think um, all of the queer and trans people I've had in the audience have felt really empowered and they go, yeah, that is ridiculous mm -hmm. uh, that I be expected to perform gender in a way that doesn't feel right. Yeah. But then in a, in a lot of ways, I mean, society has asked everybody to perform gender, gender in its own way, right? Yeah. But that's just a fact of uh, we are expected to if to to fit inside a, a gender binary that also tells us that this is what it means to be a man and this is what it means to be a woman and do not break outside of those things right exactly i'm going to tell you a story years ago uh, i've i you know what i i will admit i am not the most masculine of males that is just a fact oh. i know i know i know i know <laughs> i know it's shocking but years ago i was at a cottage and uh we were we needed to chop some wood and so we're chopping some wood out in the back of the cottage and somebody takes a picture and I put the, uh, the, the, the axe over my shoulder. And what I think at the time is like a really, like a rugged stance. But then when the picture comes out, it's like I'm holding a parasol. And I was like, well, there we go. That's, that's, that's there. That's, that's, I guess my natural expression is a little bit, uh, uh, not, not as masculine as I thought. I have that experience all the time where I go, yeah, I'm a tough guy. I'm such a tough big guy. And then uh, I very quickly, <laughs> very quickly that balloon is popped. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, of course, one of the questions uh, that, that you know, we, need to, we need to talk about is, 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 is why queer stories are important right now in this moment. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you saw, but there was a big anti-trans protest less than a month ago. Am, and there's another one planned aware. next week. I am aware of those sons of bitches. <laughs> yeah. So I think that that's exactly why. Um, there's a lot. Uh, I continue to be amazed at the amount of anti-trans, anti-queer rhetoric. Um, I made this show, what, four years ago? And I was I I'm really hoping it would be obsolete and I would stop touring it because people would go like, yeah, yeah, you're trans. Who cares? Um, but it feels like it's only gotten more important. Um, the there is a lot of anti trans hate right now, a lot of anti queer hate right now um, and a lot of uh, in in subtle ways. And I find that like 
Um, there's a lot of misinformation going around. And so I think the best way to combat that is to meet and listen to queer and trans people and just meet us and have me go, hi, I'm a person. Yeah. I exist in the world. My gender does not affect you at all. Um, I have a kid's version of something in the water uh, that I've done. Uh, I usually tour it in tandem with the adult show, um, but I did a run of it at Persephone Theater in Saskatoon. And I found that that show was even more important for the parents than it is for the kids um, because kids know who they are. And I think it's just like letting them tell you who they are and let you in um, is a really wonderful thing. And we need to like let kids do that. Yeah. There is a ton of misinformation out there and it's deliberate yeah. misinformation yeah. by bad actors who are, who are pushing an agenda because there are people who have kept quiet for 10 years or so or however long since uh, uh, gay marriage became legal in, in Canada and, and gay rights became a thing and pride, the Toronto Pride and other pride festivals became mainstream. They've been keeping themselves quiet, but they never bought into it and they always believed it was wrong. And they are using this as an opportunity to twist the narrative, their narrative to convince other people of what they believe. And it is disgusting. Yeah, there's, um, and I get, it's, I get the fears that they're preying upon. And it's, it's these fears that parents have that your child is going to end up different from you. And, and that's a scary thing of, of what if my kid is so different from me that I can't talk to them anymore. And I think that that's a natural fear for parents. I don't have kids. I probably never will. Um, but I think that that's the thing that sort of fuels this is this fear of what if my kid is different? And and I also think it's it's something that we talked about maybe a decade ago about about gay and lesbian identities was I don't want my kid to have a hard life. And it's and it's going, well, your kid being trans doesn't mean they're going to have a hard life. It's it's the people out there that that don't believe transness exists, that hate trans people. Um, that's who's going to make them have a hard life. It's not being inherently trans is is difficult. It's really not. It's really not. It can be. Absolutely. But the transness itself is not. No, just like with the, the whole with, with, with gays, lesbians, bisexuals, it, it's the it's other people who make it difficult. It's not the, the, the thing itself. There's also the fact that you know, I mean, I mean, if you look at some some groups, um, they're they don't hide it. The the idea, the the attack on on trans and queer people, is a gateway to undoing uh, gay marriage, to undoing the acceptance of gay and lesbian. It it is it is a gateway to to more hate down like immediately. So yeah, it's it's something that that, that needs to be stopped like now. And I was so happy to see that. When those minority of people tried to make a lot of noise, there were other people who came and made more noise and more people. So yeah, yeah. You mentioned doing um, uh, uh, the the kids, the more kids friendly version of the show. Um, how did you come to to that as a, as a decision to to do that? Yeah, you heard tentacle penises, and you're like, but kids are shit though. <laughs> um, when I was touring something in the water kind of for the first time i i do a lot of outreach to queer organizations um we've started running an accessible ticketing campaign so that um all of the sales from our merch go towards buying tickets for queer and trans people who maybe couldn't afford a ticket so i reach out to a lot of organizations and go like hey i'm coming to town i have the show it's it's about being trans you want to come see it do your do your groups want to come see it and i would hear back from a lot of these going great uh we have a youth group that's age 12 to 17 and they'd like to come and they're gonna come this day and i go whoa no sorry it's 18 plus um and so i was seeing this real need and uh desire for queer programming for young people um and so i adapted something in the water with uh three collaborators charlie peters Alyssa billingsley and ken mcleod who are all clowns um, from the prairies um, and they've worked a lot in TYA 
And so I worked with the three of them to sort of adapt the show to be kid friendly. Um, it, it was surprisingly easy. It was really surprisingly easy. We just, you know, changed all the sexual content. The squid is on my butt. So I have butt tentacles because kids love butts. Um, and the sort of spirit of the show is all the same. Um, it all it all just translates very well. Uh, I find it's perfect for sort of that age group where their bodies are changing and everything's really scary. Um, there's a part in the show where Barbie and Ken, I have Barbie and Ken dolls and I puppeteer them under the live feed. And when Barbie and Ken kiss, I had a theater full of 300 grade sevens lose their minds. They laughed and screamed for a full two minutes. I had to like pause the show and just like hold. <laughs> uh, it's it translates really well for young people. So we've done it for schools. We've done it in in like uh, theater for young audiences programming. We developed a study guide. Um, my, I think you interviewed Holly, who's my yes uh, creative partner from Pack Animals. Yeah. She's a teacher, and so she helped me develop the study guide for teachers um, that teach kids about gender diversity and queer issues. And so, yeah, we we have this. We have a kids version. Nice, nice. When 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 kids are properly engaged in a show, when they really engage, they are fucking awesome. Yeah, yeah. I've done uh, a lot of touring with uh, TYA puppet shows. And I found that like puppets really captivate them in a way that 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 just normal talky theater does not. Um, and kids will let you know if they're bored. They will let you know right away. They are so you have to sort of unforgiving. They are very unforgiving. Them and drunk people. Yes. And I perform to a lot of drunk people, so <laughs> it's kind of prepped me for both. Um, I'm currently uh, developing a TYA musical with Ray Spoon, who's uh, like indie music icon um and it's a puppet musical about gender diversity so we're kind of starting from starting with making it a kid's show rather than adapting this thing for adults um and so we start the puppet build in a couple months and we go to production next in the spring and we're doing a premiere in edmonton i'm really excited so you have me at puppets yeah you have me at puppets as somebody who was raised on jim henson's Jim the Jim Henson ears on Sesame Street and the Muppet Show and all of that stuff. There we go. Can, can you see my Muppet tattoo? I can see your Muppet tattoo. I can see your Muppet tattoo. And that is, I mean, that is that's the janitor, isn't it? No, it's um, it's this is Statler, okay. like the old. I couldn't see. Old... I couldn't see the whole thing because he has the similar hairline to one of the old janitors at the. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, a friend of mine has Waldorf. <laughs> we have the like old gay men that sit in the balcony and go. Boo, boo. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I will, I think I will always love puppets. That's just, just a fact. Um, what was your, what, what was your gateway to puppets and, uh, 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 how, how have you kept that love alive? Oh, absolutely. Henson. Um, my dad used to put Sesame Street on when I was old enough to sit up, basically. <laughs> Um, so I was raised with Sesame Street. We would also take out a lot of VHSs from the library that were these compilations of Saturday morning TV from the 70s. And they were all these like weird puppet shows like um, H.R. Puff and stuff oh and God. Sigmund and the Sea Monsters and all these like you watch them now and you're like, they people are on drugs. They were really on drugs. Um, There's never been a question that those shows, that many of the children's shows from the 70s and early 80s were definitely created by people on drugs. H.R. Yeah. Puffin stuff and that the whole uh, uh, Marty Croft universe, completely drugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that that sort of really influenced my aesthetic. Um, yeah. I'm also, I, I love puppets because they were, weirdly, they were a big part of my gender journey. Um, I was, I was touring with this, uh, theater for young audiences puppet show and I, I went through acting school and I was like trying to audition as a new actor and being like, Ugh, I'm just, I'm really bad as an actor. Cause I can't, I can't seem to be feminine enough for all these parts. Like maybe I'm just a bad actor. And then I got to do this puppet show and we were, uh, 
you I got to play every gender, every sort of animal. I could be a toaster. Gender didn't matter because kids didn't see that and didn't care. Um, and I when I stopped having to present female on stage, it sort of unlocked something in me where I was like, maybe this isn't who I am. And it sort of sent me in a little spiral down into my gendery thoughts and and I discovered kind of who I was and and that I was trans. Um, all all thanks to puppets. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have to answer this, but how long was that spiral? How long did it take for you to get uh, through to the other end where you could say that you are trans? It it is a thing of uh, you know I I never knew and I always knew. Like you look back on your childhood and go, oh. Right. Around the time I was hitting puberty, I cut off all my hair and I looked like Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. Huh. Wonder why. So um, it's always I've always sort of felt at odds with femininity and it always felt wrong. I always kind of felt like I'd always jokingly be like, well, I'm just a Sasquatch in a dress. Um, And so. That spiral of having the thought of like, what if I'm not a woman? to voicing that and coming out to someone was probably about six months to a year yeah yeah and you and you come out i think a lot of uh queer people will have this experience of you sort of gently dip a toe and come out to maybe one person and see how that goes and then slowly bit by bit you come out to more people and more people and more people and uh i came out i think to holly first and we were on fringe tour. And so then I was able to come out to sort of my fringe family and 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 they are a found family and they held me in that and they saw me as that. Um, and then you come out to more and more and more people. And now I'm like, hi, I'm trans. Like in the first moment you <laughs> meet me. Yeah. Uh, just on the topic of the, of, of the fringe family, I think that nobody, people who haven't done a fringe tour do not understand the intensity of that family. That... I went on, I want, my fringe tour, my last tour, it was in, in 2012. And I would, I would go to war for every single one of the people that I met on that tour. Like literally I would, I would go to the wall for each and every one of them. Cause that, you know, we, we went through it, we went through it, you know, and that is the intensity of the fringe family, I think. Yeah. And they come from all over and that has been, that has been the nice part about touring all over is getting it to be able to see people that I met my first year and I haven't seen in in years, like my dear friend Shane Adamsack, who lives in like Perth, Australia. Uh, I got to see him, and and he was like one of the first people I met on Fringe tour. Um, I was I. This is my first time back in Toronto since doing Toronto Fringe in 2019, and I had a hard Toronto Fringe. I like, not because the show did bad or anything particularly bad happened but it was just sort of like that halfway point of tour i was kind of uh, in a slump and feeling a bit like homesick um and i remember being really sad and this my fringe family bought me a bee pinata to cheer me up and then i got everybody to whisper their secrets into the top of it and then we went outside of the fringe bar and we smashed it with baseball bats so they just, they hold you when you need it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Shane's a great guy. Uh, he, again, uh, uh, 2012, he was on the Fringe Tour. That was the year that he went across Canada and then became the artist in residence at the uh, the the Mainline Theater in Montreal and just sort of stuck around for, I don't know, a year, two years. Um, the, the one thing that I, I want to talk about is something that you mentioned about, um, you know, knowing and not knowing. Um, we're sort of like veering away from theater, but we'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. Um, <laughs> and I wonder, do you think that if the gender binary had not been imposed on you, that um, if you felt like it was possible to be not a girl, that you wouldn't have been confused? Because I think that kids, like you mentioned, kids know. Oh, yeah, I... I think not, I would say not even if the gender binary hadn't been imposed on me. I think if I just had known that non-binary people existed, 
because I met my first non-binary person on Fringe Tour, my very first year touring. Right. Um, I had met other trans people, but uh, trans people who identified on the gender binary, and I was like, well, that's not me. I'm not a trans man. And so I met my first non-binary person on the circuit, and I was like, hey, that's something you can be? And it was like, <laughs> a friend of mine says, like, some of these realizations are feathers and some are anvils. And this was an anvil moment of, oh, that's what I am. And so I think it, as simply of like letting kids know the wealth of gender diversity out there and what is possible in terms of how people identify, how people talk about their gender, um, then that just gives them the tools to describe themselves better. Yeah. yeah, That's the thing that annoys me so much about this, this myth that queer people and trans people are trying to indoctrinate kids. It, it, we're, we're not trying to do that. We're trying to give kids all the information. Yeah. Indoctrination is when you like restrict what they can see. Yes, absolutely. And, and that being said, like people are often worried about, uh, kids seeing sexual content before they're ready. That's not what anybody's advocating for, no. like at all. I think I think people part of the problem is that is that we call parts of the education curriculum sex education. Yeah. Even though it is largely it really isn't about sex. It's about bodies. It's about gender. It's about so many things. But because it's referred to as sex ed, we, I think a lot of parents are resistant to it. Uh, when I was in school, my family grew up very fundamentalist. So my parents were against that curriculum. Not because they didn't want us to know about puberty and stuff, but they heard sex ed and they didn't want us to be a part of it. Um, so it, it's one of those things that, that be, I think because we use bad, poor name naming for these things, people get the wrong idea. On the other hand, though, the curriculum is there and anybody can look it up. So if, if you were really concerned, you can always look it up and it will tell you exactly what they're being taught. And you would be surprised at how little actual sex is in there. Yeah, there's um, like right now, my home province of Saskatchewan is going through it uh, because our premier has uh put use the i can't remember the word but the court basically so he wanted to put this bill in that restricted that would out kids yes. to their parents if they wanted to use new pronouns mm -hmm. or names at school and he put this bill forward and it went through the courts and the courts went you can't do this it 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 infringes on the charter of human rights and he decided to use um, the notwithstanding clause that's what it's called, the notwithstanding clause, to push it forward, which means he also can push forward other bills without them having to go to court. So this is what my is going on in my home province right now. Mm -hmm. And and this is why I think queer stories and queer stories for kids are so important mm -hmm. right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to come back to theater now. Um, and uh, one of the questions that I always ask on this show, because I'm fascinated by these stories, is the story that that brought you into the theater what was your what's your theater origin story what is the thing that you saw <laughs> or the experience that you had that made you want to make theater i had a crush on a boy <laughs> <laughs> um, so i i uh i went to weird little theater camps as a kid um, the first one was the off-Broadway theater camp in Saskatoon when I was in grade three. And I got cast as the Pied Piper, which again is one of those, how did I not know I was trans? Um, so I got to wear this weird little hat and, and take all the rats and all the children to go drown them. Um, and I got to be the lead. It's like maybe one of the only times I've been a lead other than in, you know, a solo show. Um, and then I, you know, became a teen. I grew up. I became a young adult. And I was like, I'm not going to go to, I'm not going to do theater. I'm going to be a filmmaker. I'm going to be like Spielberg. I'm going to go to film school and I'm going to be a famous filmmaker. 
And then uh, I didn't get into any film schools. And my parents went, well, you should just go to the University of Saskatchewan for your first year and like see, see, like, like they kind of were like, you have to go to school. So I went to school. And while I was there, I was part of a class where we made a film called Paper Airplanes. And while we we're making it, I remember just meeting all the acting students from the drama department. And I was like, they're all so cool. They're all so cool. I want to be like them and I had a crush on one of them and then I would and then I like started taking acting classes in the theater department and then you just kind of fall down that rabbit hole into making theater and the thing I liked about theater over film was I got to do all of it myself and I think this is probably also why I self-create and why I tour on the fringe is because like I want to do the sound design I want to design the poster I want to be involved in all all aspects of that um and 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 that's the thing I love about theater, where film felt like I could only be a part of one tiny little piece of it, and then you don't get to see it again. Theater, I got to sort of be a part of the whole storytelling process. Um, and now that I've sort of moved into directing a lot more, I find that I do get to be a part of the storytelling process. Uh, and and I try and not micromanage and just do the sound design myself, because <laughs> it sounds like you're like, oh, it sounds like you kind of are like that. Um, but I get to sort of bring on artists that I like their voice and I like their what they offer. And I love to collaborate. Um, I love to be sort of what my friend Charlie Peters would call being an instigator of asking big questions in the room and, and coming in and going, we're going to make a show about this. Let's explore it and having a group of divisors. I like to sort of assemble the Avengers of a project and go like, who are all the cool artists I want to work with? Like, that's my favorite part is just uh, putting those teams together. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned, you mentioned doing a, uh, doing theater camps when you were young. Um, what was the catalyst for starting you going to the theater camps? What, what made that happen? I don't know. I was probably just like very loud and annoying. And my parents were like, they can probably burn off some energy here. <laughs> I did a lot of like plays and like American Idol style competitions with my Beanie Babies, so probably that. That, that. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. My my parents are not theater goers. Like, let me th fully throw them under the bus. I remember telling my dad I was gonna like major in in theater in university. And he was like, "Really, theater? Oh, I hate theater." Because I think my mom had maybe one time brought him to a dinner theater thing that was bad. And he felt trapped there. <laughs> he was like, oh, theater. And now he comes to everything I make. So take that, dad. The, the funny thing about theater, and this is one of the, re the things that drives me crazy, is it is, seems to be the one art form that people are like, I saw a play once. I didn't like it. Theater's not for me. I'm done with it. And it's, <laughs> to me, it's always like, did you stop watching television when you watched a bad TV show where you decided we're going to see movies when you saw a bad movie? Like, come on. Yeah. But I think, like, because of that, I think it's so many different factors. Like, one is you had to, like, there's more effort to go to the theater. Oh, sure, yes. Right? Yeah. Like, you have to, like, leave the house, put on pants, buy a ticket that costs way more than a movie. And, and not only that is, like, you're trapped there. Yeah. You are trapped there yeah. for up to three hours um yeah find... which is why it's like i would love for those people to like go to a fringe show because yes. it's an hour yeah. and and if it's and the thing with fringe is like if you see a good show you'll talk about it for a few days and if you see a bad show you'll never stop talking about oh my it. god that is such a fact that yeah. is such a fact and you know i mean this is the thing is 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 fringe is such a low risk thing because it's only an hour and maybe not even an hour, maybe like 50 minutes, you know, you're in, you're out. If the show's bad, what have you lost? You've lost like what, $12 and a, and 45 to 50 minutes of your time. That's nothing. Um, but man, you're so right about when you see a bad show. Cause there's shows I will still talk about like 30 years later. And everybody thinks like, because Edinburgh is this big festival and it costs so much to go and it's hard to get into the big venues that. Everything there must be incredible. No. No. 
it's about the same ratio as the Canadian French circuit. It, it wouldn't be possible for everything to be to be incredible. It wouldn't be possible. There's 4,000 shows. Yeah, there are 4,000 amazing shows anywhere. Um, but I think that, you know, everybody who goes there has a certain amount of confidence in the show that they're doing, whether it is misplaced or not. Um, just to go back to Edinburgh for a second, um, does flyering work there or do you have to be more creative? Oh, that's a that's a interesting question. Um, I think flyering does work there. It's just a lot more punishing than the Canadian circuit. Like you will get people that tell you to fuck off. Um, it works there, but not in this, not to the same extent as the Canadian circuit. But it's a, so flyer, and you have to do so much else. Like you have to be flexible in so many other ways. Like. I'd spend probably an hour a day on online just like looking at Facebook groups and going like, here's my show, please come. Um, you have to be really creative. And the like cost of Edinburgh yes. is so much higher. There's that, there's that. Accommodation is a huge problem there right now. Next year, this is so dystopian. They have a cruise ship that is going to be parked in the Port of Leith that people can stay on during the festival. The whole festival. Is it, is it just like, it's like, like barracks accommodation for the festival? Yeah, it's, it's co accommodation for like, uh, the cost is so high. Like the stuff will triple or quadruple during the festival. Like, yeah, we paid almost what we pay in a whole year's rent to stay in Edinburgh wow. our first year. Wow. And, Think that was only because we had funding. Mm -hmm. That was only because we had funding. We never would have been able to go without funding. Wow. This year we were able to stay with a friend of a friend. Like when people ask me, like, hey, how do you do Edinburgh? I'm like, get funding. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Cause I and this is this is the weird reality of people talk about this on the Canadian circuit, but it's it's so much more extreme at these big festivals of like the people who come from money and who can go to Edinburgh year after year after year after year because they don't have to worry about, oh, if I don't do well, I'm not financially ruined, right? Like, they, I think festivals like that really, people that are succeeding there have come from a certain tax bracket right. that uh, I can't say Sam and I come from. I mean, they're obviously, I mean, they're in the minority. Um, now, uh, on, on the topic of flyering, um, uh, what, how is your flyering game outside of Edinburgh? <laughs> outside of Edinburgh? I feel like you're about to ask me for a, to, to flyer for you. I would, um, I would never do that. It's a thing that I have to get over my own shit about doing it as a, as an introvert. Uh, yeah. So... It's a thing that I work on every every fringe I do. But I'm just I'm always curious. Are you are you Gem Rolls level or are you are you like somewhere below that? Is Gem Rolls good? Because I feel like when I've toured, he hasn't needed to fly. Really? Because I've never seen him not flyer. Oh yeah, I think the year I toured, he was like selling out, and so he didn't need to. Maybe um, I've never. I've, I think festivals that have been at where he's selling out, he's still. I've seen him still out there. Maybe he was like just like tired that year but like he's usually like 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 you know the the like platinum level i i haven't done it in a while on the canadian circuit i haven't done it since before the pandemic so this could all be bullshit because i'm sure i have a, i i know i have a plethora of new mental illnesses coming off the pandemic um, so my anxiety might be way too high. Uh, I've done it a little bit in Edinburgh, but um, it's much scarier. Uh, I feel like I could get into a good groove. Flyering. Yeah, but I have to be in the right mood. Definitely have to be in the right mood. And it's a lot easier when your show's doing well. When your show's doing poorly and you have nobody there and the shows are hard to get through and then you have to go out and like try and sell people on them, that's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. Really hard. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, I think a lot of people who've only done a couple of festivals don't know that, you know, 
there are festivals where flyering is just not a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember being in Montreal being like, all right, let's go flyer. And, and you couldn't, you couldn't like sell a flyer to anybody the year that we were yeah. there. And there's other festivals that are like that, that as well. It's so different everywhere you go. Um, I guess the advantage to next stage is you don't really need to go flyering. I'm probably still going to go flyering. <laughs> I'm the only out of town show. Oh. And so I don't have a network of people that I know that will come. Uh, so I'll probably still go flyer the other shows and be like, I'm new in town. Want to come see my puppet show? Um, because, yeah. That should be yeah. your pitch right there. That's the pitch. It, it probably will be. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So uh, something in the water at the next stage festival uh, starting I think, next week, isn't it? Yeah, next uh, next Thursday, October 19th. So when this episode comes out on Tuesday, just a couple of days, it'll be that Thursday when uh, when you can go see the show. Grums, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you for chatting with me. This has been an episode of Stageworthy. Stageworthy is produced, hosted, and edited by Phil Rickaby. That's me. If you enjoyed this podcast and you listen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you can leave a five-star rating. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, you can also leave a review. Those reviews and ratings help new people find the show. If you want to keep up with what's going on with Stageworthy and my other projects, you can subscribe to my newsletter by going to philrickaby.com slash subscribe. And remember, if you want to leave a tip, you'll find a link to the virtual tip jar in the show notes or on the website. You can find Stageworthy on Twitter and Instagram at StageworthyPod, and you can find the website with the complete archive of all episodes at stageworthy.ca. If you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Phil Rickaby. And as I mentioned, my website is philrickaby.com. See you next week for another episode of Stageworthy. Stageworthy.